brought to you by Charity Mobile, the phone company that shares your values. More information is available at CharityMobile.com. This morning I have a classic papal document for you. It comes from the reign of Pope Innocent III. We're going back to the time of Thomas Aquinas with this one. And in this document, Innocent III goes on to describe what would happen if a pope was a heretic. It's sort of a timely topic, I think. Here he describes really what that would be like. The concept of a pope losing his salt, as, a, as he describes it. Remember, we are commanded by the Lord to keep the salt, to be the salt of the earth, and to keep our, the salt and not to become worldly. And this is why it's timely, because we live under the reign of a consecutive string of very worldly popes. So, I'll let the good and holy pope speak about this from here. On the Consecration of Pontiffs by Pope Innocent III You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its savor, in what will it the earth be salted? It is good for nothing any more except to be thrown out and trodden on by men. In these words set before us, Truth, who cannot be deceived, and who does not want to deceive, introduces a terrifying and irrefutable argument by setting forth the premise, adding the proposition, and deducing the inference, he designates the office, ascribes the failure, and infers the penalty. He designates the office when he says, you are the salt of the earth. He ascribes the failure when he continues. But if the salt loses its savor, what else can it, the earth, be salted? He infers the punishment when he concludes, It is good for nothing any more except to be thrown and trotted on by man. Therefore, whoever accepts the office must take care lest he incur failure, because he will not evade the punishment. The mighty shall suffer torments mightily, for the most severe judgment is rendered against those who rule. Certainly the greater preeminence, the heavier is the fall. For the greater the offender, the more conspicuous is every vice of his heart. So Christ says, You are the salt of the earth. Among all the virtues and gifts, two above all are principally necessary for us, clearly charity and wisdom, charity for the formation of an honest life, and wisdom for the knowledge of true doctrine. For whoever does and teaches will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For Jesus began to do and to teach, leaving us an example that we should follow in the footsteps of him who did not sin, so that there would be honesty in our lives and truth in our teaching, nor was deceit found in his mouth. It was for that reason that pomegranates with golden bells hung from the vestment of the high priest, lest, going up into the sanctuary without them, he would die. For there are many, may I myself never be in their number, who speak out but do not act. They bind up heavy and insupportable burdens and lay them on men's shoulders, but they are unwilling to move them with a finger of their own. It can be said to such as these, Physician, heal thyself. You hypocrite first, cast the beam out of your own eye, and then you may cast out the mote from your brother's eye. You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who preach against committing adultery, do you commit adultery? Clearly these two, charity and wisdom, are praised in the reference to salt, which is produced from two things, that is, heat and moisture. Since moisture is condensed by heat to become salt, charity is designated by the heat of which the Lord says, I have come to cast fire onto the earth. And what else do I ex desire except that it will burn? Many waters cannot quench charity. By moisture, on the other hand, is designated wisdom, of which Solomon says, The words from a man's mouth are a deep water, and the fountain of wisdom is an overflowing torrent. The pontiff, therefore, must be the salt of the earth, so that through charity he can shape the people by the example of his life, and through wisdom he can instruct them by the word of his teaching. Salt principally does three things. It seasons food, dries meat, renders the ground sterile. What blessed Job says points to the first. Can anything insipid be eaten that is not seasoned with salt? What is said about the fish in Tobias relates to the second. They salted its flesh. What the psalmist says refers to the third. He has turned a fruitful land into a salt marsh because of the wickedness of those who live there. This is the kind of salt that should be in the prelate, to season food, to dry meat, and to render the earth sterile. He should season the food of teaching. As truth says, Who do you think is the faithful and prudent servant, whom his Lord has constituted over his household to give them food in season? 
he should dry the meat of concupiscence, of which the apostle says, The flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And he should render the earth barren of its iniquity, as the Lord says to Adam, Cursed is the earth in your work, it will bear thorns and thistles for you. The food of teaching is insipid, which is not seasoned by the salt of wisdom, particularly that wisdom of which the apostle Paul says, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. No teaching tastes good which is not redolent of Christ, who is the relish and delight and sweetness of the soul. Thus the apostle says, let your speech be seasoned with salt. In fact, any discourse is insipid which is not seasoned with the salt of spiritual wisdom. Therefore the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, See, the site of the city is very good, but the waters are very bad, and the ground is barren. So he said to them, Bring me a new vessel and put salt in it. And he said, Thus says the Lord, I have healed these waters. There shall be no more death nor barrenness in them. Elisha, Christ, the city, the law, the water, the law, letter of the law, the salt, wisdom, the vessel, the preacher, the ground, the synagogue. Thus, the sight of the city is very good, because according to the apostle, the law is holy and the commandment is holy, but the water is very bad because the letter kills while the spirit gives life. For that reason, the ground is barren. That is, the synagogue is unfruitful because the law has led no one to perfection. The new vessel is the preacher of the gospel. Such was the apostle Paul, of whom the Lord says, This man will be my chosen vessel to bring my name before the pagans and pagan kings. He is called a new vessel because of the new teaching of which truth says, No one puts new wine into old skins. Salt is put into this vessel, says the Lord to the apostles. Have salt in you and have peace among you. Out of this new vessel Elisha threw salt into the spring, so he might heal the waters, and there would be no more death or barrenness in them. Christ, however, through his preachers, cast the gospel into the letter that kills, because it is the spirit that gives life. The flesh is unable to gain anything. In the same way, at the wedding feast, he changed water into wine, and he took the veil from the face of Moses, so that his face being unveiled, he might contemplate the glory of the Lord. Moreover, the prelate is duty-bound not only to season the foods, but also to dry the meat, to chastise his own body and bring it into subjection, lest perhaps when he has preached to others he himself might be worthless. Unless the stream of carnal concupiscence is dried up, the carnal man, like a beast of burden, will surely grow putrid in his own excrement, stinking like a four-day corpse in the tomb. This is why the psalmist said, Pierce my flesh with fear of you, for I dread your judgments. Fear is the best nail, for it fastens our flesh to the cross. As is said, they have crucified their flesh with its vices and concupiscences, since the fear of the Lord drives out sin. It is said of this again through the prophet, From our fear of you, O Lord, we have conceived and brought forth the spirit of salvation. It is also said that victorious kings sowed ruined cities with salt, lest any new shoot might rise up in them again. The victorious kings are the holy preachers of whom the apostle says, With their faith the saints conquered kingdoms. The ruined cities are the nations converted to the faith, from which the kingdom of the devil is torn down. Of this destruction the Lord speaks through the prophet, I have constituted you over nations and over kingdoms, so that you may dig up and pull down and devastate and destroy. Then we must sow these ruined cities with salt, so that whatever is budding in them will not rise up again so that the thorns and thistles of vice may not sprout from what is left. It is this the Lord enjoins in the law. In all your oblations you must offer salt, that is, add wisdom to all you say or do, lest you, what you offer to the Lord be foolish or insipid. But if the salt loses its savor, in what can it, the earth, be salted? This insipidness is twofold, one of nature, which is in constant condition. The other is a deliberate fault, which is vice and sin. Of the first, the apostle Paul says, the creation is unwillingly subject to weakness. Vanity of vanity, says Ecclesiastes, and all is vanity. The psalmist also says, all things are vanity, every one living. Of the second it is said by the same psalmist, O you sons of men, how long will your hearts be deadened? Why do you love your weakness and even try to lie about it? And again, the sons of men are liars in their self-judgments. They deceive themselves about their own inanity. As their days dwindled away into triviality, their years were quickly wasted. No one escapes the first kind of weakness, just as blessed Job has said. Man born of woman living for a short time is filled with many miseries. He comes forth like a flower and withers and slips away as a shadow. But what the Lord says, the salt loses its savor, and what else can it, the earth, be salted? 
pertains to the second kind of weakness. It is as if he had said, the prelate becomes dissolute in vice, by whom will the people be instructed? Now some lose their savor in their heart, some in their mouth, some in deeds. Those losing it in the heart are those who believe wrongly, in the mouth those who teach wrongly, in deeds those who live wrongly. Of the first the apostle says, they grew vapid in their thinking, and their foolish heart was darkened. The psalmist says of the second, Every one of them has spoken inanities to his neighbor. With lying lips and a divided heart they have spoken sinfully. Solomon says of the third, I have seen all the things that are done under the sun, and behold, all of it is futile, because admonishing the perverse is hard, and the number of fools is infinite. Some lose their savor because of moisture, some because of heat, some because of both heat and moisture. Those losing their savor by heat are destroyed by spiritual lust, such as anger or envy. Of these it is said, they were inflamed with lust towards her, inflamed from hell. Those losing savor by moisture are destroyed by carnal lust, such as gluttony and self-indulgence. Of them it is said, Behemoth sleeps in moist places, having trust that the Jordan will flow into his mouth. Those losing their savor because of both heat and moisture are ruined by spiritual lust and carnal lust together. Of them, so that the punishment fits the sin, Scripture says, they shall pass from the snowy waters to extreme heat. David says about the first, Fire has fallen on them, and they shall not see the sun. About the second, Jacob says, You are poured out like water. You will not grow great, because you went up to your father's bed. So if the salt loses savor in the prelate, by what will the people be salted? As if it says, by nothing. As divine law testifies, if the priest who is anointed sins, making the people guilty, the sin of the prelate is, therefore, both destructive to others and perilous to himself. Destructive to others because, if the salt loses its savor, by what will it, the earth, be salted? Perilous to himself because, it is good for nothing more except to be thrown out, that is, put out of office, and trodden on by men, that is, despised by the people. He will be thrown out and trodden on by men, that is, excommunicated and shunned thrown out because he has sinned against himself, and trodden on by men because he has sinned against his neighbor. It is apparent enough how this can be interpreted about other prelates, but how it should it be interpreted about the Roman pontiff is not yet clear. The servant, according to the apostle, by his own lord stands or falls. Because of that same apostle, says, Who are you who judges another man's servants? Since the Roman pontiff has no other lord than God, then who can throw him out or trample him underfoot, no matter how much he may lose his savor? When it can be said to him, enfold your justification into your own heart, nevertheless he should not mistakenly flatter himself about his power, nor rashly glory in his eminence or honor, for the less he is judged by man, the more he is judged by God. I say less because he can be judged by men, or rather shown to be judged, if he clearly loses his savor to heresy, since he who does not believe is already judged. It is only in this case that it should be understood of him, that if the salt loses its savor, it is good for nothing any more except to be thrown out and be trodden on by men. How can one say it is good for nothing any more? Does the Lord not say in whatever hour the sinner will convert and repent, he will live and not die? Did not the shepherd, leaving ninety-nine sheep in the wilderness, go to seek the hundredth, which was lost, and carry the found sheep back on his shoulders? Did not the woman light a lamp and sweep the house to find the lost drachma? And in each parable the Lord added that there shall be greater joy among the angels of God over one sinner doing penance than over ninety-nine just men who do not need to repent. Did David not lose savor when he committed adultery and murder, and yet he was not thrown out nor trampled on by men? But, his sin being forgiven, he continued in his kingship. Did Peter, who denied Christ three times, not lose his savor? But he even received the primacy. Why is it then that it says, If the salt loses its savor, it is good for nothing any more except to be thrown out and trodden on by men? Clearly it is one thing to lose savor in actions, and another to lose savor in beliefs. Whoever loses savor in his actions, as long as he does not lose savor in faith, if he repents, he will always be returned to grace, and often be restored to his former status. However, if he loses savor in faith, becoming a heretic or an apostate, he can indeed be returned to grace. But only with difficulty can he be restored to his former status, because a scar remains from contracting this kind of leprosy. Peter certainly denied in his words, but not in his heart. Lest, however, the salt loses its savor in me, which would be destructive and perilous, I ask you, brothers and sons, to implore our most merciful Father with your devout prayers, that he himself who admonished blessed Peter, I have prayed for you, Peter, that your faith will not fail, and you being converted, 
confirm your brothers, may confirm in me Peter's undeserving and unworthy successor, the faith which works through love, to the glory of his name, to the salvation of my soul, to the strengthening of the universal church, Jesus Christ our Lord, who is over all, blessed God, forever. Amen. Like I said, I think that was interesting. It's something to consider in these days, especially now that we have Francis coming and saying he's going to do the consecration. <laughs> we'll see. But are Innocent III's words timely and instructive for us today? I do think so. I think that we live in a time where, unfortunately, many of the popes in our lifetimes have done things that clearly are a break from the theology of the church and from everything that came before. What does that mean for us? I'm not sure. But either way, Innocent the Third would have you believe that this was, of course, not a good thing. <laughs> so I know that's putting it mildly. Let me know what you thought of this in the comments, please. And as always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.